All right, so we are going to shed it and get started. Good evening again. My name is Rachel Vinueva. I am the College Access Program Coordinator for the District of Dallas, and you are tuning in to March Madness Financial Aid Finals. Um, I do want to let you know that this um, is a recorded session and will be posted later um, in case it goes by kind of fast and you uh, want to gather more information. Um, so this evening, we have a couple of presenters with us who will assist you in a high level overview of what financial aid is and the um, graduation requirement um, from the state. So this is going to be presented by Colleges that changes that change lives, excuse me, and that is with Anne Morano, and then Dallas ISC College Access Program, that's me, and UT Youth Engagement Center Dallas, Mr. Joe Posada, and then Taryn Bright Haskett. Um, and we also have um, about three people monitoring the chat, uh, the QA, so they'll be answering questions as they come, you guys. Feel free to drop the questions in. They are our college access advisor professionals um, and they're here to assist you. So please, 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 please use that chat. A couple of items to note is that this is a recorded session and this will be posted later. Um, and then also if you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat to ask questions. Translation services are provided. And then at the end of this, um, session, I will provide you um, an additional resource to a college access program website for additional assistance. So you'll be able to get one-on-one -on -one assistance and also access to a resource drive, which is really great. Um, we will talk about the new financial aid graduation requirements. We will also talk about some myth busters of financial aid what is financial aid? How do I qualify for financial aid? And how do I complete the financial aid application? So our graduation requirement, the Texas Education Agency, the state, has implemented House Bill 3, which requires that seniors enrolled in the 12th grade must do one of the following in order to graduate. That's complete and submit a free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA or complete and submit a Texas application for state financial aid, the TASFA, or submit a signed opt-out form. Dallas ISD will provide instructions if in fact um, parents um, do not wish to complete this form. Um, we will provide instructions on how to opt out um, when your student is going through their graduation consultation with their counselor. So what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Ms. Taryn from UT Austin and let her um, go through some myth busters of financial aid. Okay, so the first myth of tonight, um, my parents slash legal guardians do not have social security numbers, therefore I do not qualify for financial aid. That is a myth. So the fact is the status of your parents' citizenship does not affect your qualification for financial aid. Our next, our next myth uh, is govern governmental agencies will have access to the information placed on my financial aid forms, and we know and for and we know that's a, a myth. For a fact, uh, governmental agencies will not have have access to the information placed on your financial aid forms. Uh, the federal student aid private policy prohibits the sharing of your information. So myth, my parents' legal guardians make too much money for me to qualify for financial aid. Lies, lies. Fact is, according to U.S. Department of Education, there is no income cutoff for federal student aid. Your eligibility for financial aid is based on number of factors and not just your income, plus many states and schools use your FAFSA slash TASFA data to determine your eligibility for their aid. Myth, I do not need the FAFSA or TASFA because I have scholarships to pay for my college tuition. Like I'm totally set. 
But actually, the truth is, the fact is, the FAFSA and the TAFSA, filing them, submitting them, helps you to gain more financial aid, more grants, maybe even work study, maybe even additional scholarships that come directly from the university or college. They also help the colleges and universities determine what merit scholarships and state aid or federal aid, if any, you may qualify for. So what is financial aid? Let's get into it. So the definition of financial aid, financial aid is money allocated to fund your education. This money can be used for tuition and fees, room and board, books, and miscellaneous expenses. So there are four types of financial aid. They're going to be grants, which is free money, you know, federal work study, um, loans and scholarships. And we're going to go deeper into what those four types of aids are um, in these next couple of slides. So grants, free money. We want all the free money we can get. OK, so grants are need based aid that does not need to be repaid. Um, you don't have to repay this money is given to you so you can be successful on your college journey. Um, along with scholarships, grants are the best form of financial aid. Grants are almost exclusively awarded because of financial need. There are federal, state, private, and institutional grant programs. So we want the grants. That is what we want. We also want federal work study as well. This is going to be the money you earn while you're at um, your basically while you're in college. So work study provides part time jobs for students with financial need, allowing you to earn money to help you pay for educational expenses. Unlike other types of financial aid, students will receive their work study in, more, in the form of a paycheck once or twice a month uh, throughout the semester. Once students have been awarded work study as a part of their financial aid package, it is up to them to find an approved job. So that, let's stop right here. This is very important. So if you see this on your financial, so once you submit and you receive your financial aid war, award letter, then you they will say, hey, you've been awarded work study. And it like, you know, I'm just gonna talk to my parents. This is not gonna have a job that's gonna have them stressed out. It, this, the job is included studying. So when they're not working, they should be studying um, because you have to, you know, keep up like a certain type of GPA. They don't want you failing or um, in your classes. So just make sure um, that parents don't be like, oh, I don't, I don't want my child to work while they're in school. It's gonna be like an easygoing job, most likely, um, maybe in their major, maybe in their college where they'll be actually, you know, doing some work and actually getting to study on job. And they have a lot of hours. They can't exceed those hours. So they won't be working like crazy hours, 80 hours a week or, um, you know, like just a lot of hours. It's only a lot of time. It's just like maybe 12, I've seen 12, 20, and most like 30. So um, just know that it's not that many hours that the students uh, will be holding on to. Next, so loans, borrowed money. So if it all comes down to it, yes, we will have loans that you will need to pay back. So student loans are borrowed aid that needs to be repaid with interest after graduation. Education loans different um, from different sources have varying terms. So interest rates, repayment plans, fees, and credit requirements. For example, federal direct subsidized and federal direct unsubsidized and Perkin loans have no credit or, co or co-signer requirements. The interest rates are generally lower than uh, other types of loans, whereas federal direct lo uh, plus loans, which is like a parent plus loans, require good credit and have higher interest rates. So common federal loans are direct subsidized loans, interest does not accrue, uh, accrue with, uh, while you're in school, direct unsubsidized loans, interest accrues while you're in school. So that means, so the interest rate, whatever that they lock you in is that interest rate right when you sign for your, um, your student aid for uh, that institution, that's what you're locked into for um, the four years. It, it will not go from like 2% to 20% by the time you graduate. Um, direct unsubsidized loans, uh, the interest rate acc um, accrues while you're in school. So that rate will go like bump up and up and up as you're in school. So the, in the direct parent plus loan allows a parent to borrow phone to help meet your educational expenses. So I just want to say, yes, there may be a time um, that you may have to get loans. And then I would just always say that's educational debt and that will help you um, 
you know, obtain your goal, obtain the career that you want, and ultimately obtain a better uh, lifestyle. So just, you know, we hate loans. We don't want loans, but that's why we have to do all what we need to do for grants, work study, uh, applying for outside scholarships, applying for scholarships while we're in school. So um, I just don't want that loans. I know when we hear loans, it's terrible, 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 but um, sometimes it comes down to where we, you know, we need a loan just to make that extra meat so we can be successful while we're on our college journey. Scholarship, hey, make it rain. Yes, we want all the monies. We want all the money. So scholarships are need-based and sometimes merit-based aid that does not need to be repaid. Merit can include academic achievement, talent, dancing, singing, athletic ability. Public scholarships can come from institution, institutions such as colleges, universities, uh, and school districts. And private scholarships can come from corporations and other forms of organization. So you should never stop applying for scholarships, whether that be um, you're saying, oh, I'm a senior and I don't know what's going on. It's scholarships out there. And then once you get to college, you need to be applying for scholarships all the four years. And even if you go to get your like your master's, your PhD, you go to law school, you go to um, medical school, uh, veterinarian school, you need to continue to apply for scholarships all throughout your college journey. So it's not just like, oh, I missed out, apply. If you say you hate writing, get over it, you know, because you're going to, you, you're trying to be successful and you're going to go to college. So learn to write. And there's so many places where you can get free scholarships and a lot of scholarships go, um, you know, they don't get a lot of people don't apply for them because a lot of students don't want to write. They don't want to write the essay. They don't want to watch, write 250 words that could give them like a $3,000 scholarship or $5,000 scholarship or $500. Even those small ones add up and help you be like, you know, achieve that goal of financial aid. So apply for scholarships. Don't stop. If you apply for one a day, you'll see how far you'll get. Okay. Next. So next we'll have, how do I qualify for financial aid? That's terrific. So now that you understand, there are three basic types of financial aid or well, need-based aid, merit aid, grant scholarships, loans, work study, Taryn covered it all. You're probably wondering, how do I qualify for it, right? And we're gonna share a little bit with you about the process, how to get it. But first, here's, here's some things that you need to keep in mind when thinking, do I qualify? Remember, regardless of how much money your family makes, we want you to apply because there are so many different programs and opportunities out there for you. So in order to qualify to be considered for federal financial aid, so from the United States, from the federal government, um, you need to be either an eligible non-citizen or a U.S. citizen. You need to have earned a high school diploma or its equivalent. So as an example, the GED. You need to be pursuing an eligible degree or certificate program in college or in a career school. So many vocational programs would meet this qualification requirement. So not just your traditional community college or four-year college, but also several dozens, hundreds of different vocational programs, but they have to be accredited or validated by the federal government. And if you ever have a question about that, you can ask your admissions counselor at the different school or program you're considering. In order to qualify for federal financial aid, you also need to have a valid social security number and you need to make what's called satisfactory academic progress as you make your way through college or school. And so that's a requirement that has to do with getting through a certain number of the courses that you sign up for successfully. You need to complete them and you have to maintain a satisfactory grade point average from year to year and semester to semester or term to term in order to stay qualified for financial aid. And financial aid for full-time students is a little different than for part-time students. So to maximize your financial aid, you would be a full-time student. Now, for state financial aid, and this refers to the state of Texas. So this refers to everybody regardless of their United States citizenship or residency status. So this is for all students. For state financial aid, you need to reside in Texas 12 months prior to the enrollment in the higher education institution. So what that means translated is um, 12 months before you intend to start classes at that college university or vocational trade school, you need to have lived in Texas for that entire 12 months without interruption, okay? You need to graduate from a high school in Texas or obtain your GED, your high school equivalency in Texas. 
So reside in Texas 12 months before you start classes and earn that high school diploma from a Texas high school or get your GED here in Texas. Prior to graduating from high school, you need to have lived in Texas for 36 months. So prior to your graduation, if you are a senior class of 2022 this spring, that means 36 months before May 2022, you need to have started living in Texas and had stayed living in Texas, not moved out of the state. So 36 months. And then finally, you share your intent. You need to sign an affidavit of intent to become a permanent resident when you are eligible or when that opportunity becomes available to you. We know that's a tricky situation right now, but this is a document required by um, all of the institutions here in the state of Texas, um, and it needs to be officially notarized. And so you need to see a notary who can prove that it's you, witness the document for you. And then that affidavit will be returned to the college or university where you want to attend. And I just wanna say something about working notaries. Notaries are great for uh, ver verifying or validating who you are and signing as a witness on forms that need to be notarized. Basically, they'll look at your photo identification and um, sign a form and stamp it saying to whoever you're giving it to, yes, this person actually appeared in front of me and it is this person. But a notary also, I know in Spanish, a notario may offer other legal services. Um, and just be careful when you, when you see a notario for things, especially regards to financial aid, um, because they're not technically, they're not lawyers um, and or financial advisors. Um, but a notary can witness any documents you need signed. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So now that we, you know, that Taryn had a, a, gave us a great overview of the different types of financial aid um, and discussed kind of like, you know, the requirements for federal aid and state aid. Now, you know, the, the big question is like, how do we complete, you know, how do we complete our financial aid application? And so for the FAFSA application, um, so there's a couple of steps for sure. Um, so the first one, you know, the most important one is gathering uh, the necessary documents that you need. Um, so first and foremost, you'll definitely need to gather your 2020 tax documents uh, for parents, your legal guardian. And then also if the student, you as a student worked in 2020 um, and you filed taxes, uh, we'll definitely need that as well. Um, so if you, if you have, if you have those documents, definitely collect them. And then we're also going to, and then the next couple of slides discuss what other documents you may need. Um, but if at any point you kind of feel like, oh, I don't know hundred percent if this is the right document uh, or my, or your parents didn't file or legal guardian didn't file taxes. Um, definitely, you know, you have your, your college advisors on campus that you're able to communicate with. So it definitely, you know, we definitely reiterate that. Definitely go talk to them if something doesn't make sense or if you need a, a full list, a breakdown of those documents that you need. Uh, but once we've gathered that, uh, for those students that are completing the FAFSA application, you'll definitely uh, go ahead and create an FSA ID. Um, so this is going to be for yourself. And then you'll also have the opportunity to also do it uh, for eligible parents. So if your parent has, um, it's a... It's a U.S. citizen, a permanent resident, um, or an eligible uh, uh, paperwork for it. You'll be able to create an FSA ID for them as well. And so this would actually uh, help us also uh, fill out the uh, your FAFSA applications online. But it also is not a requirement for the parent uh, to have an FSA ID. But for the student, for sure, create your FSA ID. Um, and then you can also do this at studentaid.gov. And so this is where you'll go also to go ahead and complete the start the application itself. So you'll log in as yourself as the student. You'll have the, you know, the necessary documents with you to have that. And then you're basically going to start uh, completing that information. Now you'll follow the steps uh, to complete your financial aid application. And then as, when you're logged in and you're completing your FAFSA, you know, there's going to be some other things like, you know, create a safe key uh, as an, another added step uh, for security as you're completing your, your FAFSA application. Um, and then it's going to ask a lot of demographical information about you as a student and then also about your parents. So if your parents are married um, separated, divorced, or widowed is going to ask for specific dates. So it's always good to ha have that open line of communication with either a parent or a legal guardian. So like that, you know what you're all completing in in the application in itself. Um, and then you'll be able to go step by step. I would definitely recommend you can definitely start the application at home. You can definitely do it on your own. Uh, but we definitely recommend you to come into, you know, to either your college advisor's uh, office on campus or connect with your counselor or either of them. So like that, they're able to sit down with you and kind of like guide through that process to see what information we need to put where. Um, and then so like then we can make sure that everything is being placed in the right, the right place. Um, as you start getting towards the end, 
Um, you'll have an option, uh, well, actually before this, before setting the, the FS or your FAFSA rather, um, you're going to have an opportunity to, if your parents file taxes uh, for 2020 and depending on their also on their, on their um, status on, on how they file their filing status. And then if they were able to create an FSA ID, you'll also be able to do what is called the, um, the IRS data retrieval tool. And you'll get a chance to transfer everything from the IRS website. Um, again, this definitely recommend come, come see us, come see an, an advisor on campus. So like that, we're able to kind of make sure that that information is being trans uh, transferred over. In the event you're not able to do, use that tool, um, as long as you have your, the, you know, the IRS uh, tax documents that you'd have for 2020 from your parents and yourself, you'll be able to just kind of put that information on there as well. Um, and then again, uh, towards the end of it, you'll be able to send it electronically. You as a student, you'll send it with your FSA ID. And then if your parent um, was uh, able to create an FSA ID, you'll be able to They'll be able to sign electronically in the event that they didn't. No worries. Um, you'll get what is called a parent signature page. So you'll just click, you know, on that tab. You'll print it out, and you'll have to sign it physically and date it. And then we'll have to mail it off to the FAFSA, um, to to FAFSA rather. So like that, they can go ahead and process it, and then they can go in and start, you know, getting everything that you need in order to have that. So in the event you don't know where to send that, all of that information is actually on the parent signature page. But again, come see us, and we can definitely help you kind of identify that, put it in an envelope, and mail it off on there as well. Um, so again, saying electronically and then and or the parent signature page. Now for TASFA, for the TASFA application, uh, you'll need to download uh, the download and complete the TASFA application online. Um, and then one uh, a great website for with additional information, not only about financial aid, but also admissions um, and just in, information across the state of Texas is collegeforalltexans.com. Uh, you'll be able to download the TASFA application on there. Now the neat thing about this application um, it's a PDF format, so you'll definitely download it. You can type everything in, and then at the end, you'll print it out to have all of that on there. Uh, but then you also get a, a chance to also download it with instructions. So the first five pages will be the, the your standard application for TASFA, and then the, the following five pages are going to be directly uh, for you to go ahead and, and if you have any questions or a question doesn't make sense, you can refer to, uh, to those instructions, and or you can, again, see us in person as well. Um, you also need to gather the required documents, with sim a little bit similar to, to FESA, but there are some additional documents that we'll cover in the next slide. Um, and then once you have all of that, you'll definitely mail all the necessary items. Um, so you'll put everything in an envelope. So that would include um, a, a, a uh, printed, a completed and printed and signed task for application, copies of the W-2 um, or other supporting documents that we'll cover in the next slide, uh, 2020 tax return transcript, uh, or 1099 for the student and the parents. Again, students, if you work also in 2020, you have to include those documents. Um, and then also have a notarized and signed affidavit of intent to become a permanent resident. Um, and you can also obtain this from the registrar's office as well. So what are the necessary documents you'll need uh, to gather for TASA? So for the parents, uh, you'll definitely need uh, to have either your W-2s, W-7s, or your 1099s. Whichever one applies to you, you'll have that. Um, so, you, so you'll have it to, um, uh, to, ha to have that, uh, those documents on there. Um, also, um, tax returns, if you, if you file taxes and you met the threshold, you'll definitely have that. Um, you'll definitely also want to order your tax transcript from the IRS as well. Um, so you'll just go to IRS transcript website and then fill up that information. You'll be able to um, either re request it online, uh, but most likely you have to probably request it by mail. And you'll get it by mail. Now, one side note about this is that if the student or the parent orders your IRS transcript, know that it's going to come in a white envelope and it's going to be labeled IRS. So don't be don't be alarmed, don't be scared. Because even I, when I ordered my transcript, um, it came in an envelope. I'm like, why is IRS sending me uh, an envelope? But it's because that's how the transcript comes in. So just don't get alarmed. You'll open it and you'll have those documents on there, and then we can make uh, the necessary copies to send them out to the institution you're sending your task for application. Um, and then you also need the verification worksheets that's provided by the school um, and your student portal. So this is a very crucial thing, um, especially after you submitted um, your admissions application and you created those portals for those schools. So whether you're, you're applying to, you know, you're looking at one school, two schools or five schools is very, very important for you to create a portal for each single one of those because uh, you'll have what is called holds or a to do list, um, especially for financial aid um, is going to tell you, and especially if you've been selected for verification is going to ask 
is going to kind of it's going to state what documents you're going to need to complete them. Oftentimes, some of those are going to be um, generic um, forms, or some 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 of those may be university specific forms. So, a form that one institution A may require may not be the same one that institution B requires. So, just know that create those uh, portals for those institutions you're applying to for college, and make sure you have one of those on there. In the event that you're, it's a little confusing, you definitely want to connect with the financial aid office. Um, if you're not able to find those uh, verification forms online, and then again, also, if you're having trouble sometimes uploading them or where to mail them, come see your college advisor for that. Um, as well for students, same thing. If you apply for 2020, uh, we worked for 2020, you also need, whether it's your W-2s, W-7s, or 1099s, if you were employed. Um, again, tax return as well. And if you're employed, um, you'll need to complete a, a task application for every uh, school that you're applying to. So if there were five schools that you're interested in, um, you want to make sure that you're printing, you're printing out that the task application completed five times. And then the fifth page, which is a signature page, you have to sign in physically five times and date it as well. You put that on the envelope with the required information and you mail it off to those institutions as well. Um, you'll need a notarized affidavit of intent to become a permanent resident as well. Um, some schools require documentation, uh, maybe notarized a statement or a verification of non-filing from the IRS. So for example, you as a student or even the parent as well, you um, you didn't work in, in 2020, uh, we would have to go to the IRS website and or we can also request it via fax um, or mail. We'll complete the form um, and then you'll check off uh, the non-filing um, status for that, for that year, for 2020. And then they'll go ahead and mail you an actual form from the IRS stating that you did not work in that year. And so oftentimes institutions will need that um, to get a little bit more clarification for that, we'll definitely need to connect with the with your um, advisor on campus to help us, you know, kind of identify the steps to order that form online and have that up and running. And then also know that if you earn under uh, twelve thousand two hundred as a student, um, you're not required to file taxes. Now, there's also a similar threshold for parents, but those get a little specific depending on the finding uh, status. So for that, uh, again, we heavily encourage you to come connect with your on-campus advisor. So like that, we're able to answer those questions, see what exactly we need to get. Um, and then parents as well, definitely come, uh, bring, you know, if your parents can come as well, you have any questions about financial aid, we definitely encourage you to come as well, make a, an appointment uh, or connect with the one-on-one -on -one with the advisor. So like that, they're able to kind of go through the process and have that on there as well. So there is a lot of information, you know, that they're still missing that we can definitely cover on here. Uh, but know that, I mean, this is a high level overview of financial aid. Um, and then even in this in information overload. So like Rachel mentioned in the beginning, uh, you'll have this to go back and, and kind of see, you know, what the documents you need, the process and what have you. And then from there, again, it's just heavy, heavily important to connect with that advisor on there to complete that. Right. So thank you, Taryn, Anne, and Joe um, for explaining to us what financial aid is what we need to fill out financial aid, the difference between FAFSA and TASFA, um, and all of the steps taken to need to complete. Like uh, Mr. Joe mentioned, I know it is a lot of information and it can be very overwhelming, um, especially if it's your, your first student to go to college. Um, so I recommend getting your phone, scanning this QR code, um, and it's gonna take you to our Dallas ISD College Access Program website. And on there, you can actually sign up for our next webinar. That is this Thursday from seven to 8 p.m. Financial aid final finish. So we'll talk about the steps that you will take after you complete your FAFSA or TASFA. Um, and then also on there is you have access to your college access advisor at your high school campus. So um, parents and students, please, 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 I can't stress this enough to make an appointment with that advisor so they can sit down with you um, and help you fill it out so you don't uh, feel overwhelmed. Um, the whole process probably will take you about 40 minutes, uh, just depending on if we have all the information to get through it. Um, but some takeaways that I think that you guys should take with you is, is when you fill out financial aid, this information is not shared with any government agency. Um, it's only shared with the institution in which you list on the financial aid application. Um, and then also, if you think you don't have to fill it out because you're getting scholarships, think again, you're gonna go to the institution and they're gonna actually require you um, to fill it out um, for scholarship purposes. Um, 
I just really want to stress also that, um, you know, the, the social security numbers, if your parent does not have one that you don't qualify, that's completely false. Um, please visit with your college access advisor to determine which financial aid application is best for you, whether that's FAFSA, federal or TASFA state. So again, um, we have we had 65 uh, parents and students join us. So I just wanna thank you uh, for joining us on this Tuesday evening. This was really fast. We covered financial aid in almost 40 minutes, even with our hiccup. Um, so please visit our college access program website, make an appointment, see us on Thursday, um, where we'll talk about next steps. Um, thank you to our Q&A um, hosts, Sarah and Debbie and Marla, and all of the good information that was put in the chat. Um, like I said, visit the QR. There'll be additional resources there as well. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you for tuning in um, to our financial aid March Madness. Have a good evening.